is true. We ask the questions. What is needed in the world? Is that going to be? The Arab Spring, a movement leading to more freedom and equal rights? Well, not for women, according to Amal Al-Malki, a Qatari author who is very concerned about the rights of women in the Arab world. In fact, she says despite some progress, Arab women are still largely absent from the public arena. We have no voice. We have no voice. We have no visibility. And I'm telling you, this is why women's rights should be instituted. It should not be held hostage in the hands of political leaderships uh, who can change in a second, right? Will the Arab Spring deliver its promises to everyone or is there reason to believe that women will be left behind? Today on Talk to Al Jazeera, a conversation with a woman not afraid to ring the alarm bells. Amal Al-Malki, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Are Arab women better off in terms of their rights and freedom since the Arab Spring? I'm actually one of those people who don't believe that, to say the truth. I think that there were no positive impact uh, resulting from the Arab Spring on women uh, whatsoever, to say the truth. And um, when you look at the stories signaling women during the Arab Spring, they're mostly about rape, victims of rape, like in Libya, um, sexual harassment, public humiliation, uh, virginity tests in Egypt, um, uh, religious police targeting women, uh, political discoursing, uh, discourses manipulated religiously to keep women away from the streets. Um, and in fact, those uh, stories do reflect the realities of those societies vis-a-vis -vis women. Uh, women were major participants in the Arab Spring. And for a very short period, a period of time, um, um, their um, representation, uh, whether in media or in our imagination, was romanticized. Mm -hmm. So we believed that they were equal citizens. W why do you think, you mentioned their participation in the revolution, why do you think women had such a prominent role in these revolutions? I mean, we saw them in Tahrir Square in Egypt being beaten alongside men. In Yemen, they, they burnt their veils in defiance to protest against President Ali Abdullah Saleh. Why were they such active agents in these revolutions, you think? Has something changed? Nothing. To say. The, the, the exposure was different. Basically, there was an exposure and their activism came to surface. So, for example, if you look at um, Tawakul Karman in, in Yemen, uh, she has a long history of activism. So her activism was not a result of Arab Spring. Uh, in any way, but it exposed in a way her act. The reason I ask this is because um, in, in Western media, and you mentioned this in your book, Arab Women in Arab News, uh, Arab women have always been portrayed, it's a stereotype certainly, uh, as being voiceless and veiled and so on. Mm -hmm. So it was quite surprising, I think, to many people to see these women on the streets. That's true, that's true, I agree with you. And this is the thing, women were major participants. Uh, they uh, stood uh, by the men's uh, side on the streets, calling for political reform, freedom. Um, for a very short period of time, they uh, felt and were treated like equal citizens. But the moment they spoke about women's rights, hell broke loose, mm -hmm. and and um, they were downgraded again to second-class citizens. As you say, you know their participation. Um hasn't seemed to have make, made a difference yet anyway. In Egypt, for instance, uh, only, what, eight women in the parliament out of 508 seats, four of them from the Muslim Brotherhood who are against women's issues. And yet, Egypt is also a country, one of the few Arab countries, in fact, where uh, women are allowed to seek divorce from their husbands without allowing their permission. So it's, it seems very contradictory, all this. Dichotomous in a way, yeah. right? With the issue of al-khula, it's actually, um, uh, a right that was given uh, to women in Islam more than 14th century ago. So giving them that right, I think it was in 2001, is actually mm -hmm. too late. Um, so um, I don't see it as, uh, as an important um, progress 
towards women rights to say the truth uh, there are other um, uh, developments or strides in that regards if you think of um, women um, gaining political rights for example and um, vote for voting or running for office whether here in Qatar and Kuwait mm. Bahrain Oman but, uh, Amal even if there is a, a significant rise in the number of women holding political roles will it ever in your opinion necessarily translate to uh, leadership roles in the future. I mean, uh, we've seen it in Africa, for instance, where mm -hmm. we now have, what, two female presidents. Do you think this could happen in the Arab world? Well, role models are important. So for uh, to have such role models that venture into the political arena, uh, an arena or a sphere that was male dominated, it's important, of course. They, they set the path for uh, other women to, to um, Cross. Will it translate into leadership roles? That was my question. It will, it will definitely, but it's going to take time. It will take time. What's important is um, political empowerment, political awareness. Uh, women, um, for them to reach that stage, um, they have to go through different stages of empowerment, whether political um, or, or social empowerment. Um, um, and I do believe that education has a big role in that. Now, th there is a fear now that with the rise of political Islam in some Arab countries, Tunisia, Egypt, for instance, Tunisia, you have the Anata party, that women's rights will suffer even more. W what's your take on this? Do you think uh, Islam, Islamic law, Sharia law and women's rights are incompatible? No, no, it's not. It has nothing to do with Islam. It's um, the Islamic interpretations. Um, are the patriarchal interpretations of Islam that was actually rendered into laws, unfortunately. So um, what I do think is women rights are always held hostage between political fragmentations and Islamist ideology. But many of these bodies have used religious rights to block, uh, religious talk, religious discourse to block women's rights. Yeah, so and religious discourse has been manipulated all through history. Mm. And, and I don't think it's going to stop here. Let's talk about a few examples. I want to take a look at women's rights and issues in a, a, a few countries. And I want to talk about Qatar, your country specifically. As we mentioned before, education seems to be a really important factor in Qatar. And I was surprised to find out that 70% of university students in Qatar were in fact women. And uh, also the, the divorce rate is on the rise in Qatar. People are getting married more uh, you know, later and later. Uh, do you think this is all down to education because women are getting more educated or are there other social factors involved in this? Well, edu education definitely is a factor um, and um, uh, as well as independence. So um, financial independence plays a, a huge role. Women are not dependent anymore on men. So the whole institution of marriage has changed. And I think with the new generation and their outlook, their global outlook, it's, it's, it's supposed to change, to say the truth. Mm. Now, now, something uh, that's not uh, specific to Qatar, but certainly that seems prevalent here, are uh, the consanguineous marriages, marriages between blood relatives. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, again, surprising to find that, that in 2010, 47% of marriages here were among blood relatives. What, what's the reason for this? I, I mean, is it is it about protecting cultural identity from the forces of globalization? Definitely, it's um, protecting the lineage. So it is. But why uh, is it so important to protect the lineage? Uh, it's a part of customs and the traditional formation of the country, and this is why we, we would find that one of the legal well, women's rights uh, issue is passing nationality. Uh, something that the law does not uh, permit here in Qatar and other countries that are mainly be, uh, traditionally based, let's say, because uh, they would prefer that women would um, marry within. But but there there have been campaigns in Qatar to try and and you know reduce this because mm -hmm. of course you know there are risks, there are health definitely, risks definitely. Uh, involved. Yes, are people aware of this? Uh, are women the, aware of this? I think they started to be aware. Um, it's going to take us some time. But with the establishments that are happening, the health establishments, hopefully this one, this issue has to be one of their priorities. Hmm. You, you say it's because they want to protect, uh, there's a will to protect the, the Qatari cultural identity. An identity yeah, exactly. But could it be also about uh, women's status, social status, to marry within the family, to marry a first cousin, for instance? 
I, I think this is an excuse to say, maybe one of those traditional excuses that were used to confine women to a certain frame, uh, traditional frame. Uh, and, and, and our societies. I don't think that it has to do with that. It's mostly, as you said, it has to do with protecting mm -hmm. the cultural identity, keeping it, uh, keeping it intact. And what the people that um, are not aware of, or should be aware of, to say the truth, that culture is not static, it's changing. And the new generation is a generation that understands that they, they, they um, respect their roots, but they have a global outlook. And I think that so many of those customs that you speak of mm -hmm. uh, or about uh, will change definitely in the future. The reason I, I brought up the issue of social status is because there was a controversy here recently in Qatar after um, an, an advertisement, an ad was placed in an Arabic daily here in Qatar mm -hmm. uh, seeking uh, Qatari women uh, to be domestic supervisors, and this caused a major uproar in the country. Uh, and you know, people said that this hurt the dignity of citizens, and that it was an insult to the social status of women in the country. Why is it demeaning for a Qatari woman to be a domestic supervisor? I think it has to do part. I, I I'm not sure to say the truth. I haven't even thought about it. I've heard about the controversy recently. And I think one of the issues about it is an image uh, that um, the society is trying to project out there. Um, this image is changing dr drastically. Women, for example, are taking part of uh, providing for the, for the family now financially. Women has to uh, help in providing for the family. It's not a matter of um, you know willing to. Now they really have to um, uh, partake or participate in the finances of the family. Um, but, you know, I, it's, it could be a class issue as well. Yeah, b because, you know, for, for Westerners, it came as a bit of a shock to see people shocked that this, you know, was an insult to the, the social status of Qatari women because reactions like these, in my opinion, only reinforce the stereotype that many Westerners have of Arab women as being perhaps um, of, as having a complex of superiority, for instance. Uh, the 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 um, also the, the stereotypes that you know. Arab countries disregard human rights, you know, do domestic people, domestic workers' rights, and so on. And you mention these stereotypes in your book, but reactions like these uh, on the ad about the ad in in that paper only tend to reinforce these stereotypes. Don't you believe? I no, they create a new stereotype, to say the truth, because this is a stereotype that I haven't heard of before that. Um, the stereotypes that we're used to, there's a long history of stereotyping women and representing women or misrepresenting women in Western media. Um, and an Arab woman has become an image, so um, it has become an, a distorted image. At the moment you say an Arab woman, it uh, conjures up um, a set of stereotypes and images that are associated with um, her being passive, mm. voiceless, draped in black, not um, belonging to a certain class like you say. So this is a reverse to those kind of stereotypes that I was talking is about. Is that also, the the, the, just the description that you made there, is that also how Arab women are portrayed in Arab media? How do they appear in Arab media? They, they are not seen. Mm. Uh, they're, um, they appear in hard media only, in hard news only one-fifth as often as men. Mm. And what's the cause? What's the consequence of that, that absence, as you say, from we our media? We have no voice. Right. We have no voice. We have no visibility. Mm. Just to come back to the, to the you know, rights issue and so on, and this example I gave, um, you know, can, can Arab women really talk about women's rights if they don't recognize and uphold other women's rights, including domestic workers' rights? Definitely not. It's um, women's gender equality and women's rights does not differentiate in terms of class or color. Um, and this is one of the things that the book actually emphasizes, um, the diversity. So we looked at 2,300 news from across 100 uh, media sources in the Arab world. And what we discovered that on one hand, we have the uh, emerging new class of, let's say, elite, cosmopolitan class of women that are highly educated, the, that um, act on basis of gender equality. They come from the Gulf area, mm -hmm. they do, 
uh, and from other parts of the MENA region. And we do have the voiceless, um, the victims of war, um, poor economies, and, and etc. But we, see, we saw the diversity in between as well. So you cannot reduce Arab women to one entity. One Arab women aren't and should not be seen as one homogeneous entity. Mm, that's very interesting what you say. And there's another um, part in your book that I found really interesting was that uh, you know, the fear and threats women face in war zones and non-war zones. And you explain that, you know, the reason women are seen as being passive in countries like uh, uh, Afghanistan or in places like Gaza and so on is because they're constantly confronted to fear and threat. Can you just elaborate a bit on that? And how is it different for women who are not in non-conflict zone in countries like Jordan, for instance? I don't want to um, give everything from the book because I do want people to buy it and read I'm it. I'm sure they will. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that I want to say that um, because of the fact that we covered Arab women in specific, and we classified those stories according to the concepts that were associated with, with such representations. So one of the presentations were fear, of course, and those were more on the passive side of our study rather than the active side. But even within the passivity of, of being victims of war, we saw some very active voices of women, whether um, we did not cover Afghanistan. We gave a couple of examples, but we covered only Arab women. Mm -hmm. um, Arab women who come from very diverse backgrounds, whether religious, traditional, um, economic, um, political backgrounds, but not, uh, not Afghani uh, women in this. Um, uh, we, we covered uh, women in uh, Gaza, for in Gaza, example, right. women in Iraq. Um, so those women, although they were, con uh, they were under severe circumstances that made them passive, they had voices and they used their voices. And this is what we called actually encoded in the book as source effect. They, their stories were a construction. Their voices were a construction of the story. They made up a part of the story about them and those news. Mm. Now, what about the, the women in non-conflict zone? You mentioned, you gave the example of Jordan in your book mm -hmm. and the example of honor killings. I mean, this is always something that shocks many, uh, you know, in, in Western uh, media and Westerners, uh, and not just Westerners, I believe, but shocks many people, in fact, honor killings. Why is it still prevalent in many countries today? Is it because it's protected by the law? It's okay for a man to... to uh, protect his honor by beating his wife or beating his relatives? Yeah, it's a part of um, a patriarchal law, unfortunately. And let me, I don't want to dwell on honor killing, but let's talk ad about all of those issues when we talk about some Arab women are victims of patriarchy, are victims of domestic violence, of polygamy, of honor killing. And th this is just to mention a few. Um, but again, we should not generalize, not all women. Mm -hmm. This is a part of pre-Islamic patriarchal culture. It's not Islamic in any way, and those who claim that this is a part of an Islamic culture is, is wrong, basically. Um, um, another thing is even women from all parts of the world um, are confronted, face those kind of issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so patriarchy is not... Um, um, not a an Arab woman thing. Yeah, be because there is a belief, as you say, all women are confronted with this, but there is a belief, the widespread belief out there that the oppression of women, their exploitation uh, and social pressures to which they're exposed basically are the characteristic of Arab and Middle Eastern countries and, and you know, third world countries. Yeah, unfortunately, and, and they look at it as um, they either refer it to their religion or uh, their societies, male-dominated societies. Well, the, the truth in this statement is, yes, most of the societies are male-dominated, are patriarchal societies. Patriarchy is not something that, not a characteristic of only Arabic societies. So women all through the world, from different parts of the world, do suffer from um, date rape, from domestic violence, from glass ceiling, uh, from so many issues, to say the truth. But the whole, the, the, the oppressed Muslim or oppressed Arab woman, and allow me to use it interchangeably, although it should, you know, I shouldn't, mm. but I'm, I'm using the Western um, way of, of putting it. Um, 
the, the oppressed Arab woman is a part of a bigger rhetoric. It's a part of a, an Orientalist a colonial rhetoric and a clash of a colonial rhetoric, you say. And a colonial rhetoric, exactly. The, the British colonialists, um, with the help of uh, British media, British literature, and this is back in the days, have used this ex excuse of the oppressed Arab woman um, to legitimize um, uh, colonizing uh, other countries and legitimize actually oppressing uh, those people by saying, look at those men, they don't treat their women right. So how come, how come they can um, rule their, themselves or their countries? Mm -hmm. But colonialism has ended a long time ago and yet things don't seem to be moving forward. Things don't seem to be changing. In Morocco, for instance, there was that the case of that 16-year-old who committed suicide after being forced to marry her rapist, which is in the Moroccan law. Article 48 of the Moroccan Penal Code, Amal, says that men who defend their honor by beating or killing their wives or female relatives may be acting in extenuating circumstances. This is shocking. I mean, to, to, to think that in this day and age, this is still the law in many countries. And I'm telling you, this is why women's rights should be institutionalized. It should not be held hostage in the hands of political leaderships uh, who can change in a second, right? And we've seen what happened in the Arab Spring. Our uh, religious fractions, uh, it should be institutionalized. Governments should be held responsible for treating men and women equally. Now, we, we touched on this a bit earlier, the issue of sexual violence, and you gave the example of Egypt uh, during last year's revolution assaults, particularly uh, sexual violence towards women became common. You know, we heard many stories of women being harassed, stripped naked, and, and, and you know, being dragged by the police and so on while taking part in these protests. Do you think that this is a perverse consequence of a society in which sexual activity outside of marriage is not right. I don't see how you connected both, <laughs> to say the truth. Right. But I mean, then how do you explain that women in Egypt have been constantly harassed, not you know, by, by men, you know, when they take the bus and so on? You know, many people tend to think that this is because you know, they live in a society where again sexual relations are forbidden outside of marriage and therefore that there's this this frustration. I mean, I know it's very taboo to talk about, but I think a lot of people are interested to find out why. So sexual oppression, I guess, yeah, could be a main reason for that, definitely. Um, the way they the, the, the societies perceive women, I think, is, is the main reason for that. Women are still perceived as um, property of men, unfortunately. Uh, so as long as and women... And ma that makes it okay then to touch them when, when they're getting on the bus? <laughs> it's never okay to do that. I know, I'm, I'm just being, you know, I'm just... Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, and this is why I'm telling you, I don't think that anything good came from uh, the Arab Spring. Well, the only thing that came, uh, that came out of the Arab Spring in regards to women rights is that it exposed it to the world. Women rights are violated. Women freedom, women bodies, um, uh, women safety is violated on daily basis and the Arab Spring exposed it to the world. Mm. So sexual harassment then as a tool of political oppression as well. Definitely, and look at the virginity test, that was oppression. Yeah. So then, you know, what are the prospects? And, and we've painted a very negative picture, mm -hmm. you know, throughout this interview. I mean, do, are, you, are you at all optimistic that things could improve? Well, I have faith in women movements. So whether, you know, regard, regardless of their um, agendas, as long as w whether secular or religious, um, there's a whole movement of Islamic feminism that um, is set to reinterpret the Quran mm -hmm. from a feminist perspective. Islamic feminism, that sounds very interesting. Very uh, interesting. Wh what exactly. is it exactly? What do you mean by that? It's Islamic a whole movement feminism? that was generated that actually is very active in the, in the States right now. Um, and uh, that uh, generated sometime in the early 1990s. And um, uh, they basically, they um, state, they base their arguments of women equality on the religious discourse, looking at the Quran itself, um, uh, claiming strongly that uh, Quran and God gave us women um, full um, uh, rights and equality uh, 14 centuries ago. And what happened is the Misri inter interpretations and the patriarchal interpretations of the Quran. So basically, Quran or Islam gave.